All right, let's begin. So um, today we're going to continue our discussion uh, on quantum mechanics. And um, before we begin, we're going to talk briefly about the officers for next year. So as of now, um, we're working on a, a form for the officer elections where we discuss a few guidelines for officers. Um, we recommend you to apply to be a good experience. Um, we have some information and um, different positions you can see information about. And we have a question on physics background, uh, on why you're applying the best candidate what, and what you would plan to do as well, along with additional information. And also, um, Jenna and I are also going to make a video um, for officer recruitment as well. Uh, so th those are our current plans for officers next year. Um, and we're going to do that like, sometime during this week. So uh, check your inboxes uh, throughout the week, I suppose. And uh, we will be releasing a video as well as the form for application. Okay, so now we're going to review the Copenhagen interpretation. So the Copenhagen interpretation basically it's the explanation at, at of the meaning of what quantum mechanics actually means in real in real world. So in order to know about Copenhagen interpretation, we first need to know the Schrodinger's cat. Basically, it's a thought experiment that discussed a problem concerning Copenhagen interpretation, a cat that is both live. A cat is cannot be cannot be determined as live or dead before you open the box. So it addresses like two main problems. First, what is the meaning of a wave function? A wave function. So the wave function means like what you when you didn't open the box. And what is the meaning of the collapse of wave function when you open the box? So use of the wave function. The first view says that the wave function represents a real physical state. But in that case, we have to explain what does it mean for a cat that is both live and dead, which is, which is basically impossible. And for the second, for the second wheel, wave function describe a system. It talks about how the system work when the system is not a real property. And then there are also two branch on the second view. The first branch says that there exists a real physics property, physical property that we do not know yet. But this, and the second branch says that the wave function is simply the subjective, subjective description of knowledge we have concerning the system's property. And the Copenhagen interpretation is in the second branch. So Copenhagen interpretation is currently the most popular explanation concerning quantum physics. And its leader includes scientists like Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. And to be clear, the interpretation does, it, it does not share a specific point of view. Its main theory is combination of several, several different or even ambivalent ideas that share some similarities. But these ideas are not identical. Some of these ideas even contradict themselves. So the main, I, the most important idea of Copenhagen interpretation that there is no objective reality independent from the observer. Like Niels Bohr said, everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. The idea was that if you do not observe a system, then its reality is meaningless because you basically, you cannot describe things that you don't, you don't, you don't know. True reality is not reality itself, but what we see. Reality is basically it says that reality is dependent on people's observation. So it, because basically if you're if you are not seeing anything that how come that is being regarded as reality. So in order to understand it, we can look into this story called the dragon in my garage. It basically describes a dragon, a dragon that exists in the garage, but it cannot be touched, feel, or detected by any method. So it 
it basically implies that things that cannot be observed through any means are basically meaningless. You may you might say that there is a dragon in my garage, but if you cannot do if you cannot know anything about it, then its existence is not does not have true meanings. So, so an idea that there's no objective reality might shock you because it implies a strange world, like that when you are not when you are not observing, the world becomes a superposition state of different properties. And when you open your eyes, however, everything changed into a reality you are seeing. So doesn't the world change according to our subjective observation? Of course not. You are simply bounded by the idea that reality exists because of the world does not have a real physical state. The world is, however, created through our mean of observation. We are like the, we are like the non-player characters in a video game who can only see things that are played in the game but have no idea that the game is just a, just a combination of programs. So does this imply that we could live in a game like that? So in the Copenhagen interpretation, consider this question to be meaningless because it doesn't matter whether the world is fake because reality does not matter. So this idea of Copenhagen interpretation, it actually explains like most of the phenomena that, that we observed or calculated in quantum mechanics. It's, it might seem very bizarre or strange, but it do work. But there are also many flaws uh, and, and, other, and other different explanation. But this is just like the most common and most well-known interpretation. So we find that to understand um, quantum mechanics, it's a very good idea to hold on to a lot of the mathematics uh, to get changes regarding that. So one key uh, tool that you need in the mathematical tool belt is your eigenvalues, right? So uh, matrices in linear algebra are defined to be the transformations of vectors. And so the transformations would be scaling and rotation in a vector space, right? And um, so there's like a, a certain vectors for which the matrix uh, does not rotate, but only scales it, right? So um, that's called, the, the value by which it's being scaled is called an eigenvalue. So basically the mathematical representation of what I just said is this equation, a v is equal to lambda v, where v is what you call an eigenvector and lambda is what you call an eigenvalue. And eigenvalues are the characteristic values of matrices, right? So um, if you subtract like the, the lambda v on both sides, for example, then you can come out with this identity um, from properties of linear algebra, that the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero, which is like a fundamental fundamental theorem uh, in linear algebra. So um, later we'll look at a problem with uh, the system of uh, like one half spin states, right? You have two one half spin states and how can eigenvalues apply to like the Schrodinger equation and the Hamiltonian of that system, as well as arriving in different eigenstates and stuff like that, right? So this eigenvalues is a very key idea. We recommend you do a little bit of research to solidify this concept, but um, so that, that's the basic principle of eigenvalue. Next, we'll review some of the uh, key bracket notation that we use to represent um, vectors in quantum mechanics as well as states. So um, you have this ket vector, which you can see using like the, the right uh, the right caret symbol. You have the in the bracket notation, you have the bra vector, which is like the left caret symbol, right? And uh, so for each ket vector, you have corresponding bra vector. Next, we look at bracket notation. This is like if you combine these, this is this combination of a bra and ket vector, you can kind of see. This is actually a dot product or an inner product, which can apply like for both like real vector, complex vector. And um, the inner product will give a probability amplitude, uh, which you'll square to give probability of particle in the state, right? And so um, in this example at the bottom here, uh, you can see different components of uh, this vector alpha, which is also something that we're going to see in the system of one half spin states example next time, right? Where you can take different components using the operation of the dot product. Uh, also, if the two vectors are orthogonal, their inner product is zero, which is basically what this component thing is doing. It's taking the dot product. And so, uh, it, for example, like alpha sub one component, alpha sub two component, right? So this is like one alpha right here. This part at the left is only going to take the alpha sub one component, right? Because if you cross it with any other components, you'll find that there's orthogonality and that um, component will cancel out, essentially. 
I'll look more concretely into that a bit later. You also have this idea of operators that can be represented by the matrices, right? like the Hamiltonian matrix, right? And so um, there's the matrix element where alpha prime tells you row and alpha double prime will tell you the column. And uh, so you can see that over here with the different operators. And um, using our system of one half spin states will get a lot more concrete regarding this. But um, this is another key operation um, in quantum mechanics, you have expectation value, which is just like you're familiar with the expected value of a measurement, but we define it a lot more formally uh, using probabilities in quantum mechanics. And so you can see this example of an expectation value of position here using the integral over like a probability amplitude, right? Using the wave function and um, using this uh, x caret as well, right? So you have the operator of the observable in the integral of the wave function. And next, we'll discuss the Stern-Gerlach experiment. So um, in the Stern-Gerlach experiment, before we discuss that, we have the key ideas of magnetic moment and angular momentum, right? So magnetic moment in electromagnetism is quantifier of the torque, right? That the charge will experience in a magnetic field or the tendency of objects to align with a magnetic field, right? It's, you can look at this definition right here. You have that the torque is equal to the magnetic moment cross the magnetic field. So um, this helps us to define the magnetic moment. Um, and we'll look a little bit more into that as we go into the stern gerlach experiment. We also have um, angular momentum, which is, uh, there are different types, right? We were discussing this in the last unit when we were talking about mechanics. In mechanics, we have classical orbital angular momentum. Right? And so when we think about like spin angular momentum in classical mechanics, right? You can see that that's just another form of orbital angular momentum where the object is spinning about its own axis, right? In quantum mechanics, you have like an entirely different, entirely separate intrinsic spin angular momentum of different particles, right? Which we'll look at in a minute. But let's think about an example in which a particle is in a circular orbit now. And so you can calculate magnetic moment for that, right? You have mu is equal to I times A in that case, <laughs> which is the current times the area. You know that current is just uh, the charge over the period, right? And then the area is just the pi r squared if the particle is in circular orbit. And next you can use the t is equal to two pi r divided by v, right? If we use t equal to two pi r divided by v, and then make simplification, you get q v r divided by two, the pi will cancel. And then you know that L is equal to like m v r, right? So you can substitute that back into here using algebra. You say that it's q over two m times L. So that was a very nice computation where we looked at the magnetic moment um, for a particle in circular orbit. Let's proceed. We have the stern gerlach experiment here. There's a really cool diagram of stern gerlach experiment in which you have an oven and there's silver evaporating with it in the oven. And so you have a collimator, which makes like the straight rays from there, right? Then you have these magnets here. There's a start, sharp point. You see the sharp tip? We'll go into that as well. And so you can see on the detector right here, you have spin up particles and spin down particles. So let's elaborate on what we were meaning, what we're talking about here. So um, why did we choose silver, first of all? Well, it has to do a lot with spin and orbital angular momentum. Um, so there's only one particle here, right? There's only this one valence electron, which is the main component of this intrinsic spin angular momentum that we're discussing, right? Um, all these others uh, basically have negligible contribution to the spin angular momentum. Um, they instead contribute to the orbital angular momentum, right? But it's this one valence electron on the outside that we care about because of it's the intrinsic spin angular momentum. And so um, we have these different calculations for orbital and intrinsic spin angular momentum for the magnetic moment. And so we went over this first one from the previous slide, but um, for the second one, it's a JQ over 2M times S, which is the intrinsic spin angular momentum, which varies depending on the particle that we're discussing. So as we iterated for silver, we mainly care about the electron where G is two. Next, you have another key property from angular momentum, um, which derives from the relationship between the force and the work. Like force is the negative gradient of the potential. So force and potential relationship derives this property. Where force is magnetic moment, a dot product of this, which is partial derivative of magnetic field with respect to the Z axis. And so um, we take the dot product, right? And so the only component that will remain is Z because of orthogonality, right? The X component and the Y component will cancel out within the dot product. And then only the Z component remains. 
So the most brilliant thing about the Stern Gerlach experiment is that um, when Stern and Gerlach took the measurements, they found that the intrinsic spin angular momentum of that electron, right, of the silver atom, is either spin up or spin down, right? And we can extend that because of the uh, intrinsic spin angular momentum contribution of this one electron. Right? Only the one electron has significant contribution. And so you have the spin up and spin down states. And the sharp tip will allow for the spin up atoms to be deflected upwards and the spin down atoms to be reflected downwards. Why is that? Well, it's because of the signs in this expression, right? So Q is equal to minus E, right? So there's a minus sign here. And as Z increases, the magnetic field component will decrease. So this is also negative here. And so the negatives will cancel out. And so you have this very uh, convenient result that spin up atoms reflected upwards, spin down atoms are reflected downwards, right? So here's some of the key motivating ideas using like electromagnetism as well as intrinsic spin angular momentum um, to understand the stern gerlach experiment. So now we're going to look at quantum wells. So the situation that we're going to be looking at is the infinite square well, also called the particle in a box. Uh, and this is a hypothetical situation where a particle is moving freely in a box that it cannot escape from. Uh, so I'm going to use the annotation pen as a little pointer. Um, so here we've got this figure uh, showing the infinite square well. Uh, we can see that this is a function of V of X, the potential energy. And inside the well, the potential energy is zero, whereas everywhere outside the well, the potential energy is infinite. So uh, we're going to have zero kinetic energy outside the well and maximum kinetic energy inside the well. And so that means that psi of X is only going to be non-zero inside the well, the wave function. Uh, and so let's just say that the boundaries of the well are going to be at x equals zero and x equals L. Could you go to the next slide? Uh, so to look further at the infinite square well, we're going to start with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so we're going to have negative h bar squared over 2m d squared psi over dx squared equals e psi. And so we're going to rewrite this equation uh, using a new variable k. So we define k as the square root of 2 times m times e over h bar. And then we're going to plug this new value into the rewritten Schrodinger equation. And we get that that is d squared psi over dx squared equals negative k squared psi. And so now we're going to rewrite the equation again in terms of sines and cosines. So we're going to have psi of x equals a some constant cosine of k of x plus b another constant sine of k of x. And so now we can actually simplify this equation even further by looking at the case for, psi, for x equals zero. So if we have that psi of zero, uh, since uh, x equals zero is going to be at the boundary, the wave function is going to be zero here. So we have that that is going to equal zero. And we have that that's a cosine k of x. I'm doing my best. <laughs> plus b sine k of x. And x is going to equal zero. So psi, psi of, sine of zero is going to be zero. So the sine term cancels. Uh, and cosine of zero is one. So this is just going to be equal a equals zero. So now that we have that a equals zero, we're going to plug this back into the equation and that's going to cancel this term. So now we just have that psi of x equals b sine of k of x. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so now we're going to look at the case for x equals l, which is the other boundary of the well. So we have that, that psi of l is again going to be zero uh, and that's going to be b sine of k l. And then if we divide by b and solve, we get that kl is going to equal n pi. So we're going to have multiples of pi. But now the question is, what values of n are we going to be accepting? Are we going to have positive numbers, negative numbers, zero? Um, so let's look at each of those. What values for n are we going to use? So if we have that n equals zero, then that means that k of l is going to be zero and sine of zero is zero. And so the wave function is going to go to zero, which is not allowed because we're inside the well. So n is not going to equal zero. What about if n equals negative, uh, negative values? 
Well, that's actually going to be redundant. And the reason for this is that sine is an odd function. So sine of negative x equals negative sine of x. Uh, and so if we have like negative cores, cores, corresponding values of n, so like if we have n equals one and n equals negative one, then they're just gonna be the same wave function just with opposite signs. And when we're looking at wave functions, uh, if you think about it, what are we going to do with the wave functions? The only way that we make use of them is if we square them first. Uh, and so when we do that, the negative sign is going to go away. So having negative values of n is going to be the same thing as just having that positive value of n. So the negative values are going to be redundant. So there's uh, for n. You can go to the next slide. So what do we gather from this, that we're having positive integer values of n? So we said that k is dependent on whole numbers of n. And in our definition for k, we said that uh, it's proportional to e, the energy. So therefore, we have e being dependent on whole numbers of n. Uh, and therefore, we're going to have discrete energies because we have whole numbers. If we had like decimal values for n, then we would be have then we would allow continuous energies. But we're not doing that. Uh, so we can uh, see a fundamental property of quantum physics, which is that we have discrete quantities uh, here in the infinite square well. Uh, so we're going to keep going with this example. Uh, and so in a couple slides ago, we found that KL equals n pi. So if we solve for k and we plug that into the uh, wave function, then we get that psi of x equals sine of n pi x over L. And again, uh, uh, the only way to like get stuff from the wave function is if we square it, uh, is if we square it and then we're going to integrate both sides. So we're squaring both sides and then integrating. And so we get that psi of x is going to equal root two over L times sine of n pi x over L. And so now that we have uh, this wave function, we're going to see what that's going to look like for different values of n. So for the case of n equals one, the ground uh, state of energy, we just have this one node of the wave function. But then if we jump up one energy state to n equals two, we have uh, two nodes. And then if we go to the next slide and look at the case for n equals three, we have three nodes. And for n equals four, four nodes. So you can see that which, with each iteration of n, uh, with each uh, increase in energy level, there's another node in the wave function. So as uh, the system gets more and more energy, the wave function gets like more complicated. And so the final thing that we're going to do with the infinite square well is that, so we've looked at uh, what the wave function is gonna be for different values of n. So if we look at every value of n, if we look at all of the energy uh, states, then that's basically everything that we could know about the system. Uh, and that's going to be the exact same thing for other systems, but they're just going to be a little different. They're going to be multiplied by some constant. So we can write any function f of x as a sum of the wave function over all n multiplied by some constant c. So we have that f of x equals the sum over all n of this constant c of n times the wave function. And then just plugging in the value for the wave function, we have that f of x equals root two over l uh, summing over all n times c of n times sine of n pi x over l. So we can use this solution for the infinite square well uh, to, to write other functions, which is cool. All right, now we'll end off with uh, some demonstrations regarding the quantum well that we exited out of here. Okay, so um, we'll look at molecular workbench. I think that's visible, I shared my screen. Okay, so this should be visible. Um, so there's a lot of very nice demonstrations in the quantum mechanics library, but I will look at a few. We'll look at the quantum well demonstration. I think um, we'll look at, let's see. 
So there's, there's a lot of different, de different demonstrations for quantum walls. I'm depicting the solutions to different equations. I think there was one specific one. There was like, um, so like if there's a quantum motion in a box, that's one of the examples, or one, one of the key demonstrations regarding the quantum well. There was also another demonstration regarding different energy levels, and we were able to see a, a similar behavior as to what Jenna was showing. I'm trying to find that one currently. I think it was. All right, so I think this, this one kind of shows that if you see it at the top right here, like the wave function, you have the amplitude, and you can kind of start at the bottom here with the potential, and you could increase at like, different energy levels and see how the wave function becomes uh, increasingly more complex, and it gains like more harmonics in the wave function here. And you can also look at differences between like a classical harmonic oscillator as well as a quantum um, harmonic oscillator, uh, where you can see this is a nice example of a classical harmonic oscillator that we're familiar with. But I'm here you can look at oscillating potential and kinetic energies within the quantum harmonic oscillator as well. All right. I think, okay, yes, this one. This is the one. I apologize for finding some time to find that. Um, but here you can see that as we increase the energy level, you see the wave function and the amplitude changes. Right? It becomes increasingly more complex as we increase the energy level. You're seeing like a 17, 18, 19. And so, um, and that's the idea of one-dimensional one quantum mechanics where you have the square well, right? And you can also have quantum motion in a box. And these pictures are connected via the equations that Jenna was showing. All right, so that concludes. Thank you so much for attending, everyone. We hope that you learned something. And uh, be on the lookout for uh, officer email. <laughs>